morning, we all know the title and theme and all of this kind of stuff that's going on. Now keep in mind what we're doing here, we're, we're, we broke it up, we've been for a couple of weeks of course, or a few weeks I should say, with the Belize trip and some of the other things that have happened, we've been, we've sort of set this aside just because there was a lot going on, sending the sherry off and the report on Belize and all of the other things, but we're going to jump back in here now to Acts chapter 17. I have been looking forward to teaching this chapter for a long time because uh, we're not going to actually get to that portion of it today, not that the rest of it isn't, but you're going to find some really cool stuff as we move forward as Paul deals with, with these guys um, in this place that we even know today as Athens. But what, we, what you come to when you come to chapter 7, we're basically in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey. Now it's important to remember that <clears throat> what Paul did in response to the call of the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus road there was to actually take the gospel beyond the walls and the borders of Jerusalem and Judea and actually get the gospel going out. And we, we took a lot of time looking at that first missionary journey, and we've talked about it many times, and all of the places that he hit on that first journey, kind of, kind of making a circle, sort of, a, you know, in that pattern, and going out, and then he come, came back, you know, kind of, kind of went this one way and then reversed his deal to go back and, and stop at the, the churches that they had planted. So we took a lot of time to look at that. And we were introduced to a group of churches that would become uh, known as really as a region. Um, and that is uh, uh, the churches of uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby. And what we looked at when we, when we talked about those churches is that they all were part of a place that was called Galatia. And Paul would later write a letter, which we call an epistle. He would write an epistle to those churches, the churches of, the, of Galatia. And then the letter is entitled Galatians. And it was meant to be a circular letter. So it was passed around uh, those particular villages and stuff as the churches were growing. And Paul would instruct them. And then, uh, then after the first missionary journey, they reported back to the church there in chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, they launch out, actually the latter, latter part of chapter 15, launch out into what we call the second missionary journey, of which we find uh, the middle of that uh, route here this morning. And what's really cool about this, and I shared when we started this, all of the books that we read in the Scripture, when you're flipping through the Bible and you're reading through the New Testament, in particular the epistles, and you see like Romans, you see Thessalonians, you see Ephesians, Galatians, we've already talked about, Colossians, so on and so forth, you get all of these different names. If you don't understand really where they came from and the background for each of those places, then you really can't understand uh, in particular Paul, because he wrote most of them, you can't really understand his heart for these churches. But as you journey through the book of Acts, following Paul on his journeys, what you discover is that uh, the birth of each of these places, uh, or the church within each of these places, that became very near and very dear to Paul's heart. Now we've seen repeatedly that as Paul and Barnabas, and initially on the first journey with Mark there, but now the second journey, he's with Silas and Timothy. Uh, Mark and Barnabas have gone elsewhere to do their ministry. But as he's going through now, he's going not only through what we know today as Turkey, which is where that first missionary journey focused on, the gospel has actually entered up into what we know today as Europe. And the first stop was there, and what we know today again is Greece. That was the entrance of the gospel into Europe. But it's interesting as you follow this through and you see each of these places jump out, uh, and find what, what was going on there when Paul met those people there and initiated these churches, what we call today a church plant, um, and then how he later writes a letter back to them is really fascinating to understand because so many people want to tell you that the Bible is myth. It's just a bunch of, you know, uh, it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, hearsay and, and folklore and, you know, you know, fill in the blank. But when you understand uh, and you follow the book of Acts, which is a really a historical account of what's taking place, that you find that you discover all of these churches that Paul would later write to. That is not folklore. That's history. And so it's really interesting to look at it from that perspective. So we have already seen now the churches in Galatia, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. We have seen now, as we've got into this, um, that Paul has uh, also visited a, those same churches, on his, initiated his mission uh, journey with those first churches, churches of Galatia on the first part of the second missionary journey. But then he's going to move on, and we saw where he already went to Philippi, which he would later write a letter which we know today as, the, as Philippians. And this was a church that was near and dear to Paul's heart. In fact, his letter to them, 
is uh, really can be read as a missionary newsletter because he's reporting back to the church in, on many accounts of what's taking place in the ministry. And the church is helping him financially. They've helped him uh, personally by sending people. Epaphroditus had come from that church to help and minister with Paul. And we just go on and on. So we saw Philippians uh, established on this fish, first missionary journey. So this is where we pick up the story. Paul and them have basically been chased out of Philippi. Okay? Because remember, they were arrested for preaching the gospel. They were thrown into jail. And while they were in jail, they were singing hymns and they were praising God for the opportunity to share the gospel, not only within the, the walls of the city, but now within the walls of the prison. You see, you can't keep the gospel down. They can arrest us all they want. But you can't stop the gospel. Pastor Saeed, who's now home, Praise God for that, huh? Uh, it's incredible if you've learned, listened to any of the stuff that he's talked about. He was able to share with many people, you know, um, in, in these prisons in a place like Iran. So the gospel is never, as Paul would tell the Philippians, it's never chained. And regardless of what bonds are put on our hands and our feet, the gospel always extends. And so because of that, the Philippian jailer, we know that worked there, was going to was going to commit suicide because he had assumed when God opened the gates of the prison by the earthquake that all the prisoners had got out, which meant that his life was forfeit. But Paul said, no, relax, dude, we're all still here. And so this guy come in trembling, remember we had the story, and he said, what, listen, what do I have to do to be delivered? Obviously, the God that this guy, Paul, and, and Silas and Timothy, the, the God that these guys worship, really seems to be God to do the kind of stuff he does. And of course, they were taken out of the prison to, to the jailer's home, um, the, he washed their wounds that had been inflicted on them during their, during their incarceration. And then he brought them back to the prison where, of course, they were released the next day. So Philippians was a rough place to minister. And yet, it was phenomenal what the gospel did there. As we said, it can't be stopped. So now they are departing from Philippi. And if you look at a map, it's right there on the coast of the Asian Sea. And what they're going to do is they're going to take a course, and we're going to be looking at that here in just a minute, and they're going to take a course that basically directly runs west, basically between the Black Sea and over into the Adriatic Sea. And it's just, though it's called the Ignatian Way, the Romans used it and, and many people, and that's the path that they're following. Now that the gospel has initiated in Europe at Philippi, they're going to take the gospel now along this road that Rome has has uh, uh, substantiated, and they're going to come to this new city that's called Thessalonica. So that's where we are here this morning. So this is what happens. This is the now in verse 1 of chapter 17 that you can see. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as, was, as his custom was, he went into them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, that is, the Jews, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So this is the entrance of ministry, under Paul's missionary journeys, under his work, under the second missionary journey, this is the entrance of the gospel into a city called Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica was a city that was established way back during the days of Alexander the Great. Actually, it, had, it was called Therma because there were some hot springs there, but it had been called that. But when uh, later on, during, uh, uh, during Alexander's rule of the world, when he died, one of his generals, uh, one of the four that his kingdom was divided up again, was a fellow by the name of uh, Cassander. And Cassander married the sister of Alexander the Great, and her name was Thessalonia. And he, named, he changed the name of the city, Therma, to Thessalonia, Thessalonica, in honor of his wife, the sister of uh, Alexander the Great. That's where the name comes from. Now, if you look at a map today, you will see that that city is still there. But today, it's called Saloniki. Imagine that, Thessalonica, Saloniki. And so it's still in existence, and there's all sorts of archaeology that's been done there that proves that Paul was actually there, and many of the stuff that he wrote in the Gospels, which for years everybody said, he could have never went there because he said this, and Luke, Luke recorded this for us, but archaeology hasn't done that. Well, turns out those guys were wrong. Archaeology has discovered that there was a great ministry in this place called Thessalonica. This church, Paul would ultimately spend, we believe, about six months. And we read here, we're going to go back and look at this a, a little more in detail. But he had spent three weeks or three Sabbaths, three Saturdays, in the synagogues, specifically ministering to the Jews. Okay? 
That's what he was doing there. And in the meantime, between those Sabbaths, no doubt, we're not told, but certainly, he was ministering within the city, the realm of the city itself. We believe that he spent about six months there, though we don't know that for sure, but it appears that that's sort of the time frame that it looks like. During that time in his ministry there, the thing that was foremost on Paul's mind as he ministered to the churches and uh, to, the, to the people in Thessalonica was the Lord's coming. You cannot read 1st and 2nd Thessalonians without coming to the conclusion that the Lord's coming is predominantly what's on Paul's heart as he writes both of those epistles. Um, once you leave the building, you cannot return. <laughs> We should get those stamp things, right? So you can, you can only get it. Like, like they do at the football game. You've got to pass it under the light. But the, the, he, this was important to Paul, the Lord's coming. And it should be important to us, by the way. Because most of the church today could really care less about the Lord's coming. And my perspective on it, from, the, from a scriptural perspective, is if you don't believe that Jesus is coming back, you're not going to live the way you should. If, you're, if, you're, if you know that he's going to return someday, then it's going to cause us to walk a little bit straighter, a little bit staller, right? Because he is going to come back, and what we believe about that is pretty, pretty much irrelevant. Anyway, so he ministers there, and, and this was the focal point of his teaching, the Lord's coming. In fact, every chapter in both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians makes reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every chapter. I mean, that's pretty amazing. 1st Thessalonians deals with the Lord's coming as it relates to the church. And that's why there's great confusion in the church. They know the Lord's coming. And this, this boggles the mind how people read this letter and think he's talking about the second coming when he, clearly he's talking about there the catching away, which we, of course we know is the rapture. People say, well, the rapture's not scripture. Oh, bunky hunky. Yes, it is. It's just not called that, so get over it. But anyway, he writes this, and the confusion is he's writing back to the church. And by the way, this is, we believe, is his first letter. It was written about, really about a year after his, his starting of the church. There was great confusion there. They knew the Lord was coming. But they, Lord, they knew that the Lord hadn't come. That's the point of First Thessalonians. Paul, we know that the Lord is coming. But you said, you taught us that something was going to precede that. And we're afraid that the people that have died before this are going to miss it. And that's why Paul writes First Thessalonians to explain to them, no, 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 no. So it's not the second coming that he's talking about. They knew the Lord was coming. They had no qualms about that. The issue was what had happened to the people that died and the results of the things that were supposed to take place, what were they going to miss before the Lord's return? So that's 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians deals with the Lord's coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in its relationship not to the church this time, but to the world. And this is where Paul deals with the idea of God's coming wrath. But you and I, as the body of Christ, Christ, are withheld. We're kept out of that wrath. That's the words that are used there. We're rescued from the wrath. Okay, so that's what's going on in those first, uh, in, in first and second Thessalonians. So Paul's ministry there was really, really significant. All right. So now let's take a look at this again and, and sort of go back through this and with this basis set in here and watch what happens. And we'll see how this plays out in uh, both of the epistles as well. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So from Philippi, they went on that Ignatian way west. I'm going to do it this way. It's backwards for me, but for you guys. They went west to get over to this place called Thessalonica. It's about 100 miles between Philippi and Thessalonica. And the two cities, you can see there between about 30 miles apart. In other words, roughly a day's journey and walking. Now, for me, if I was walking, it would be about 10 miles a day. But for these guys, you know, they hot-footed everywhere. They didn't have bikes and buses and, you know, all the other stuff. And so, but as they left Philippi, they first came, as they're on their journey west, they came to Amphipolis. That was the first city. Now, we're not record there's no ministry recorded there. Possibly there wasn't a uh, synagogue there, so Paul didn't really minister there. Or, or it's probable, rather than possible, that he left the ministry to these two cities because uh, Apollonia was also another 30 miles, so 60 miles from Philippi. He left left those two places to be ministered to by the Philippian church. That was their responsibility to take the gospel. That's how Paul did it. He would go to these major cities. He would raise up a church. He would train them. He would equip them. And he said, now you're responsible, church, to get the job done and take the gospel. Because obviously he nor any of us could hit every one of these places. 
So it is believed that he left Amphipolis and Apollonia, the ministry there, to the church that had been established at Philippi. Probably the Philippian jailer probably changed uh, occupations. And as far as we know, we don't know he wasn't named, but it appears that he becomes a great minister. Okay, so this is where they were going. And then they came to Thessalonica. So they've journeyed about 100 miles. So there was an overnight in Amphipolis and an overnight in Apollonia. And then they came to Thessalonica. And when they get there, there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now we learned in Philippians, or at Philippi, sorry, that when Paul got there, there weren't enough Jews there because it was a hotbed for retired Roman soldiers. <laughs> we, we realized... we. Why is that funny? I thought, I thought it was pretty clever, actually. But anyway, um, that's where they were at. And so there wasn't enough Jews there to do a synagogue. So what happened is, which was the custom, if wherever the Jews were, if there wasn't enough people to make a synagogue, they would meet by a river or something else. And that's what they were doing in Philippi. That's where he met Lydia, remember? And that's how it all started. But when he gets to Thessalonica, notice there was a synagogue of the Jews there. So there's a lot of Jews there. There's enough to have a pretty large synagogue. And then in verse 2, as Paul, as, was, as his custom was, went into them. And for three Sabbaths, so three Saturdays or three weeks, he reasoned with them. Now notice this, from the scriptures. Not from personal opinions. Not from personal prejudices, not from a personal point of view of trying to win anybody over. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. In other words, he forced them to confront the truth as it is delivered within the scripture itself. That is what we need to do. See, we make a huge mistake. We always want to argue with people about their belief or unbelief instead of simply allowing God's word to do what he said it would. It will not return void. We always want to talk about politics and economics and, and, and ethics and, you know, different theories and all of our different, you know, the people that we've learned from and stuff. Paul never did that. And this was an extremely learned man. He went to the source of all truth. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, it's important to understand this is the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. They were, they were living it out. And later on, the gathering of the letters along with the Gospels would be, I don't know, which would become the New Testament. But at this juncture, there's no New Testament. It's all Old Testament. Now, the reason I'm driving this point home to you is because as a pastor dealing with other pastors, a lot of guys want to stay away from the Old Testament because they believe it was for another dispensation or whatever, and they don't want to go there. And, well, frankly, you can't find the Gospel there. To which, again, I say, bunky hunky. Yes, you do. The gospel is all over the Old Testament. Jesus' fingerprints and footprints are everywhere. From the beginning to the end of the Old Testament. Everywhere. For those with us on Wednesday nights, we've really been focusing on this as we've been making our journey through Genesis. Which we started when Genesis was written. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's been a long time we've been in Genesis. But it's been really cool to see. And, and we've seen that from the get-go, I mean, right outside the garden, you have, you have the gospel presentation and the, the idea of a redeemer coming into this world is right outside the garden. What do you mean the gospel isn't in the Old Testament? You see the problem between relationship with God and religion towards God in Cain and Abel. What do you mean you don't see the gospel there? And we can go on and on and on. It's all over the place. Paul is reasoning with these Jews supposedly experts on the Old Testament, he's reasoning with them from their own scriptures, not from his opinions. And what does we find in the scriptures? He's explaining and he's demonstrating. This word explaining means to open up fully. It means that Paul took the scripture, probably much like we do, read the scripture and then tore it apart. He opened it up. We call that expositional teaching. It's the, one of the distinctives of Calvary chapels. I'm asked oftentimes, well, what is a Calvary chapel? You'd be surprised how many people don't know. And I said the distinctives of Calvary chapel are, are worship, fellowship, but most importantly, the teaching of God's word. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That's what we're known for. That's called exposition. I'm not going to come up here and give you my opinions. You shouldn't be interested in my opinion any more than I'm interested in yours. <laughs> This isn't about opinions. This is about truth. If there's one thing we need today, it's the truth, man. Right? 
Enough of this dancing around garbage. You know, shut up. Read the truth. <laughs> Teach the truth, and you're going to be just fine. It's so, ugh, so aggravating. It drives me insane. But he's explaining, he's opening up, he's exposing the passages of the, of the Bible. Now, obviously, he's there three weeks. Okay? He's not going through the whole Old Testament, clearly. Okay? There's no way I could go through the whole Old Testament in three weeks. <laughs> I can't get through a chapter in three weeks. But you see what I'm saying? But that's, this is what he's doing. And so he would do what we call probably a chronological approach. Here's the deed for a Savior, sin. And here's what the Savior was promised. He's coming. And then, and guess what? He's come. That's what Paul did. He would focus on these passages and then he would open or he would expound it. But not only would he do that, he would also demonstrate. The idea of demonstrate here means to place alongside. So he would teach the scripture, he would open the scripture up to them, teach them, read the passage, and then he would explain to them what the passage talked about. Just like Ezra did when the law was found, when Jerusalem was rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity. <coughs> Ezra went in there, they found the scroll, and we read in the book of Ezra that Ezra sat down and he, he taught the teach, he, he read the scriptures, and then he explained the scriptures. Now, this paraphrased, obviously, but you get the idea. This is not just a New Testament philosophy. This is Old Testament. We learn from Ezra, one of the greatest teachers recorded in the scripture. He, they had given his people back to the word of God. Forget about the Assyrians, forget about the Babylonians, forget about the Egyptians, forget about all that. The only thing we're interested in is the truth, in the, God, uh, the truth found in the Word of God. And that's what he's doing. He's explaining and he's demonstrating. But notice what he's doing here. He's explaining and demonstrating that, notice this, the Christ. For them, the Mashiach. Right? That the Christ, which is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah, it means the anointed, the one specifically chosen by God, to reestablish not just, not just rule on the earth, but redemption on the earth. And that's what the Jews had missed and continue to miss today, sadly. Many of the Jews, not all of them. So he explained and demonstrated that the Christ, for them they would have heard Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Now wait a second, they would have said. The Messiah? The son of David? He's going to suffer. He's going to be killed. Obviously, he's dead because he has to be risen from the dead. Well, that's not the Messiah we're waiting for. We're waiting for the Messiah to ride down on his big white steed with the armies of heaven behind him and, and wipe out the Roman army and establish Jerusalem and, and the Jews back as the promised people of the land. That's the Messiah that they were waiting for. And sadly, they're still waiting for that Messiah. So Paul takes great pains to go to the scripture and say, yes, Messiah will rule, but first they must redeem. Sin has to be dealt with, man. You can't just push it aside and say it's not important, especially if you're talking in terms of a kingdom. If you're going to be a citizen of this particular kingdom, then you're going to have to earn entrance into that, and that comes through redemption. And that's what he's talking about. So that the Christ, notice, had to suffer. This wasn't a just a, gee, we think that we might read it. Isaiah chapter 53, especially for the Jews. Isaiah, my gosh, one of the, their great prophets. And he clearly taught in Isaiah chapter 53 that the suffering servant was the Messiah. But they said, no, no, it's speaking of Jerusalem. It's speaking of the Jews. The suffering is the Jews. Really? I mean, you can't read that chapter and come to that conclusion. You just can't. But they do. So that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer. Do you understand? It's hard for us to grasp this because we don't have this mindset that they had. They've been steeped in generations of this particular teaching that the Messiah, and now here comes this yo-yo. We don't even know this guy or where he's from. And he shows up and he tells us that Messiah has to suffer? What? You know, that doesn't, it, it makes sense to us, but to them, it would have blown them in the weeds. They just would not have been able to grasp this. But that's what he did. He had to suffer. And he had to rise again. Wow, you mean Messiah has to die. You can't rise again unless you're dead. That's the, kind of the point. If you rise up and you're not dead, you really haven't risen from anything. Except gotten up this morning, right? Had some coffee and got on your way. No, rise again, clearly. So not only was Messiah to suffer, but he was to, he was to die. 
which meant he had to be buried, which meant that, wow, now if he's going to be this redeemer, then he has to rise from the dead. Well, that's exactly right. So Paul took great pains to go through the Old Testament and line these guys out with this is the stuff that God's word teaches from all of the law and all of the prophets. Not just a few. Holy cow. The book of Psalms is filled with messianic references. You cannot escape it in any chapter, as I've already said, throughout the Old Testament. You just can't. It's always there. And that's what he's telling them. Now what he does is he, ch he challenges them. And he said, so this person that's going to do these things, I'm telling you, notice, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. He would have said, Jesus. That's the name that he would use, which is the Greek form of Yeshua, which is the Hebrew and Greek of Joshua. He who saves. The great Savior. That's what he's saying here. This Jesus, Yeshua, whom I preach to you, is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Not could be. Not might be. He is. Because he fits all of the criteria. When you look at the Old Testament and you understand that Messiah first must redeem before he can reign, then only one person qualifies to fit that category. His name is Jesus. Yeshua. That's who he is. And they were listening to this. This is whom I preach to you, Paul says. To preach, to proclaim. This is who I'm proclaiming to you. All that the Old Testament said, this man has fulfilled. His name is Jesus. Yes, even raising from the dead. Which is the great theme, as you saw when we looked at the theme of the, the book of Acts resurrection. Over and over and over again, Paul makes a beeline to the resurrection. Because it's the thing that sets apart. And it's going to be the resurrection that's going to blow the philosophers at Athens on Mars Hill into the weeds. They're going to listen to everything Paul says until he speaks about the resurrection. Because you see, that makes whoever this person is completely and utterly unique. No one else can make this claim. And that's what's taking place here. Now, in verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. In other words, they got a hold of what had been presented to them. But notice it's just some. Some of them were persuaded. But notice, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks. Now, we've talked about these guys before. There were people that were not Jews, Gentiles. Here they're referred to as Greeks because they lived within a Greek culture. In fact, it's Greek. Macedonia for them, Greece for us. And so they had this, this whole pantheon of gods. When we get to this Mars Hill incident, I can't wait to teach this. It's so much fun. I've been doing a lot of reading on this, and it's really, really cool what Paul does there. But what's interesting about this is he walks around Athens, and he's going, man, you guys got statues all over the dang place. And we're going to talk about a guy who came in the past and said, man, it's easier to find a, a god in Athens than it is to find a man. Hundreds and hundreds of these gods for everything. God of Taco Bell. It's an important deity. <laughs> Right? I mean, come on, man. That, that stuff is significant. It's God of pizza. I mean, we all know it came from a God. It's Italian afterwards, right? <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. But they had all of these, but many of them, a multitude. And we've seen this repeatedly as we've moved through the book of Acts. These people were sick of all of the talk about the gods. Because these gods don't do nothing for you. You can try to appease them. You can offer sacrifices to them. You can, you can be diligent in your, in your, uh, uh, you know, your, your lifestyle and, as in following them. And they don't do anything for you. And many of the Greeks, as well as Romans, had been disillusioned by these gods. Cornelius was one of those, remember? Disillusioned by that. But they'd heard about this weird group of people called the Jews. And they have this one God. But this one God is creator of all things. And not only is he created, he's benevolent. He's compassionate. He's merciful. Man, maybe we should start following the, that God. And so many of them had come and started listening at the synagogues to the teaching of this God. You see? It had piqued their interest. Some of them became what we know as proselytes. They wanted to become full Jews and they were circumcised and they had to do all of the other stuff to do that. Others just wanted to hear about this God. So imagine that's you, and you've just, the, all around you, there's all of these people that are bowing down to these gods that never do anything for anyone. 
And you go to the synagogue and you're hearing this teaching over there and you're saying, wow, this is a God I would like to get to know. But they don't know him well enough because they don't know how to reason from the scriptures. They're just sharing. And then all of a sudden, some little dude walks in and tells you that all that stuff you've been, is fulfilled in this person whose name is, for them, they would have seen Yes, uh, Jesus. Jesus. For the Spanish, Jesus, because the two languages are very closely related. You see, this is what's happening here. No wonder, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, those are the Greeks that wanted to learn of God, but couldn't understand him, couldn't find him, weren't getting what they needed. And not a few of the leading women. Women. There's always a lot of leading women. Did you ever notice that? That happens here. Kind of a scary thing. No, I'm just kidding. But this always happens. Now, what this means is these were women that were wives of guys that had some authority. Okay, these were, you know, they had riches. So these were, these were women of the upper classes. I'm sure there was the low, but he's talking specifically about that. The reason I'm pointing that out is because it's going to become important here in just a minute. So not a few of the leading women. In other words, there were a lot of them. Notice what they did. They joined Paul and Silas. The word joined there literally means adhered to. They stuck to the teaching that Paul had brought. You see, all of this, and you know this is truth that you're hearing from the Jews about this one God, and you want so much to know, but it's just, it's, it's just right there, and you just can't get a hold of it because it's not clear enough. And then you hear that person that just, poof, and the bulb goes, bing, and all of a sudden it makes sense. It doesn't mean you understand everything now. It just makes sense all of a sudden. We're going to be talking about that again when we get later on in chapter 17 because that's really significant. But they joined Paul and Silas. They became followers, not of Paul and Silas, but of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not the messenger. It's never the messenger, but always the message that changes lives. And that's what they're doing. So though they're you know, equated with Paul and Silas, they're mostly equated with not the messengers themselves, but the message that they had brought. Verse 5, but. There it is. We always talk about this. For those of you that have been through our IBS classes, but this contrast, right? As I've said a hundred times, buts are huge in the scripture. <laughs> because they're going to show you a complete opposite to everything that you've just heard. They're huge. Whenever you find one. In my Bible, whenever I'm studying and going through these things, I always highlight them because I know that a change is coming. And that's what's happening here. But... In other words, in contrast to all those that were persuaded, whether they were Jews, the Greeks, the great multitude of Greeks, or the women, either way, in contrast to that, the Jews who were not persuaded became envious. Weren't they just, didn't, wasn't their Old Testament scriptures just expounded to them? But the thing that drives them is not the encouragement or the explanation of the scripture, it's their envy, jealousy. The big green monster, right? It gets in there. Man, we've been teaching these people for you know, 50, 60 years. We get this small group of following. This yo-yo comes in with this message, and all of a sudden the whole dang town's following them around. We're going to see how, how significant their ministry was here in just a minute. So they became envious. They disregarded the teaching of the Scripture. Maybe if you guys had taught the Scripture, you might have had this kind of success as well in ministry. But that's not how they saw it. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious. And they took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So these guys are envious of this. They've got to stop this somehow. We can't, we can't keep letting everybody leave our church and go to the next church over here. Something is wrong with that picture. See, that's what's being said here. Well, could it be that you're not teaching the truth? But anyways... This is what's taking place here. But what these guys do, they got to get something going. Well, they go to the marketplace. The word here for these evil men is basically the derelicts. They were the guys that just hung out in the street, didn't have anything to do, were always looking to cause trouble, and could be hired very cheaply, bottle of wine. And so they went to these guys, and they appealed to these guys to initiate this uproar in the city. And that's exactly what they did. They went and got these guys from the marketplace. And these guys gathered a huge mob. And notice that they set all the city in an uproar and they attacked the house of Jason. Why attack the house of Jason? Because it's where Paul and Silas were staying. And Timothy, that's where they were staying while they were ministering there. Jason is a, is, is a, uh, a citizen of this city 
of Thessalonica. He had obviously become a believer. He had put Paul and the guys up and, and was taking care of them. And probably there was a ton of Bible studies going on in the dude's front, front room. They know exactly where everything's going on. So this mob goes over there to find Paul, but they can't find him. Paul and Silas, we have no idea where they were. Whether they had been alerted to something like this and they had beat feet and got out of there. Or whether they just happened to be elsewhere ministering. We just don't know. Whatever the reason, they weren't there. So they attacked the house of Jason and they sought to bring them, that them is Paul and them, out. But Paul is not there. They sought to bring them out before the people, before the mob. See, that's what you do if you want to quiet something down. You get it out there before the mob because we all know how fickle the mob can be, don't we? Remember the crowds on, the, on what we know as Palm Sunday, on the triumphal entry it's called? When Jesus entered the city and all those people laying their robes and the palms down and saying, Oh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes. And then a couple of days later we're shouting, Crucify, crucify him, crucify him. How? Because somebody had stirred them up and started yelling it. And the crowd follows. You can't trust the crowds. Don't buy into this successful ministry because of the number of people that follow. Don't buy it. Oh, that dude's teaching 30,000 people. So, well, it looks really impressive. Does, does it mean anything? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say it does or it doesn't. I'm just saying be careful. Don't make numbers, multitudes, the evidence of whether something is successful in ministry or whether it is not. If you can get two or three people to adhere to the gospel and live it and teach it to other people, that's a successful ministry, folks, that God recognizes, whether it gets on, on TV or not. That's what we're talking about here. We always equate success in these massive things with, with killer ministry. And it just isn't so. These guys that pastor these huge churches, they'll tell you, they all wish that they had small churches. Because in the small churches, you can know everyone. And it's true. It's nice to know everyone, or at least, at least fairly well. We're getting kind of big now, so it's kind of hard to keep everybody straight. Plus, I have a past of melting brain cells, and that doesn't help any. But so we, you know, doing, doing these things, it, it's just nice. It's nice to know people. I know where to go to get a good Italian meal. <laughs> I know who to go to to get good Mexican food. Uh, I know everything about this church. <laughs> I know who makes killer cinnamon rolls and who makes biscuits and gravy. I know everything. Those are the things that are significant in ministry. <laughs> Hence the runner's physique. Okay. So they go to Jason's house, where they put it, and they sought to bring them out. They wanted to take these people into custody and bring them out before. Notice that there's no officials involved in this yet. This is all mob rule. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren, obviously other Christians, to the rulers. Now they're taken to the rulers. This is all illegal under Roman law, by the way. You don't get to do this. But this is a Roman colony, and you know they, they kind of give them their thing, and it's led by these guys called Politarchs who are sort of the magistrates of the city, and that's who they're being dragged to. And so Rome kind of just took a thing. But notice what's happening here. Initially, it was over the envy uh, of, of all of these people shifting over. Watch, though, the accusation that is brought against these guys, Jason and, and, the, and the, um, the brothers. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these, these, Jason and these guys, obviously by association, Paul and them, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. You see what's happening? Wouldn't it be nice if people could say in anger or otherwise about Calvary Chapel and Mesquite that these have turned the world upside down? What a great testimony to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, to turn the world upside down from a biblical perspective is to put it right side up. The way God intended it to be all along. That's the power of the gospel. But from their perspective, these guys are turning, notice, the whole dang world upside down. Now for them, the world would have been the Roman Empire. This is, this is the, that's not what initiated the problem. The problem was envy, jealousy. And now they've changed this. And Jason has harbored them. He's put them up. He's taken care of them. And these are all acting contrary. Now we can't get that. You know, we can't get this going. So the Jews are like, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to appeal to Caesar. Because who's going to argue with Caesar? And not a good idea to argue with Caesar if you want to keep your head. 
You just don't do things like that. So bring Caesar into this and we'll make it. And hadn't we heard this guy talk about this Jesus as king? Absolutely. He's coming again. Right? So Jason harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Saying there is another king. And notice they got the name right. Isn't it interesting? They remember the name. Didn't mean anything to them. But they got it right. How sad that people to this day can still utter the name Jesus without any comprehension of what it means at all. It's thrown around in, as, a, as a curse word. You know? I, I mean, it just, it just, it's just sad. But that's what they're doing. You see, they brought Caesar into that. So this is the only way to silence them. You know, the magistrates aren't going to listen to this because they know these guys haven't done anything politically wrong. They're not causing any problems. All they're doing is stealing our sheep. So we've got to stop this. Well, how are we going to do this? Well, you know what we can do? Remember, he's, Paul, that dude was talking about a king. Let's, let's use that. I mean, you can see what's going on here. It's happened, it's happened before already. Okay? Saying, there is another king, Jesus. Well, what they forget to lift out is that the, the king, Jesus' kingdom, was not here yet. It was being built. It was being established on earth. But it wasn't here until the Lord returned. Again, the second coming comes into play in Thessalonica. Imagine that. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they, uh, when they heard these things. Because if you're a ruler of the city, you can't tolerate anybody speaking against Caesar. You've got to stop this or you're, you're, you're in trouble. Okay? So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. In other words, they said, listen, basically, here's how we're going to quell this, this issue. You're going to have to give us what we would probably call a bail type of a thing so that, you know, so that everybody can agree to this. So you give us a little bit of bail. We're going to release you, but you've got to do that on the promise that these guys cannot be in here preaching again. Now you wonder why Paul wrote so quickly back to the church of Thessalonica. He longed to go back to Thessalonica, but he couldn't because this, this deal that was made. He would say in his letter to the Thessalonians, you Thessalonians, you know what we went through there. But your fate has sounded like a trumpet throughout all Macedonia. He never held anything against them. He understood that it was time for him to move on. This was probably God's plan to get him out of Thessalonica. Maybe he would have spent too much time there had he not done so. But because of this, he's now left the city. Remember the same thing happened with Stephen. Jesus had said, listen, you guys, you're going to be my witnesses. This is just before he returned to heaven. You know, Forty days exactly after the resurrection. And he said, listen, you're going to be my witnesses and you're going to start here in Jerusalem and then you're going to expand to Judea. And then you're going to expand to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? And wherever you go, I'm going to be with you. And then he was taken up into heaven. And they said, well, this is how he's coming back again. So why are you standing around here gawking at the clouds? Right? And so that's the same thing that's happening. So the, the whole kingdom concept has been established all along. That the king is coming back. And so they said, look, we can't allow these guys to come back into the city and preach this message. And yet Paul said, but the gospel has gone out from you and sounded like a trumpet throughout all of Macedonia. And everybody talks about your faith there. And he had so longed to go back, but he wasn't able to. So he would write, about a year later, he would write a letter back to this church, that, two letters actually, that we know as First and Second Thessalonians. And you cannot read those letters without seeing Paul's heart for this church. And Jason, and there was a fellow that becomes pretty well known whose name was Aristarchus, was also one of the believers there. More about him later. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, then they let them go. So it seems that everything is settled down. And then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So we know that Paul and Silas and Timothy were still there, even though they weren't at Jason's house. We just don't know where they were or why they weren't there. But we know that they were still there. So, when, uh, so the brethren said, listen, man, we did this kind of deal. Don't worry about it. We're going to take and share the gospel. But you need to get out of town, all right, because of our pledge. Um, and we just think it's a smart thing to do. We'll continue the work of the ministry. And Paul said, okay. And what we learn in a few minutes here is that he's going to leave Silas and Timothy with them because he's the only one everybody really wants. Because he's Paul, the Pharisee. Saul, the Pharisee, who is now Paul, the believer. So he's the one that's on the hit list. So he leaves Silas and Timothy in Thessalonica. Okay? So when they arrived, uh, when they arrived in, in um, uh, Berea, notice that uh, some of the brethren from 
Thessalonica went with him to Athens, so he's been going west. Now he's turned south. He's gone down south, right along the, uh, the uh, Asian Sea. He's gone right, almost directly south, actually, to Berea. And here's what happens when he gets to Berea. And I know these are verses that we've heard a hundred times, but this is really interesting. So when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. There he goes again. You would think, you know, you know I would think if I was walking and ministering along with Paul, I would sit him down by the campfire and say, listen, dude, we got to talk. This, this, this concept of yours of going to the Jews all the time, it's not really working, Paul. <laughs> Every time this happens, bad things are the results. So maybe we should go a different way and see, let's, let's minister to the Greeks and then let's see what Jews are drawn to that and then we can minister to them. But you always want to go to the synagogue, dude. Don't you understand? Do you know when we were ministering overseas, we were told, well, we don't want to minister in that building. I, I, I kid you not, real incident, because that building was used by the Hindus. And we don't want to go in there because that building was used to worship idols and, you know, therefore... The, and it was like... What? Are you kidding me? What part of you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth did you fail to understand? What part of the fact that you're called as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ to do the very thing that you're trying to avoid? Enter the enemy's camp. Stop sniveling about it. I told you guys a hundred times. Oh, the devil's just after me. He's doing this. Well, then turn around and punch him in the stinking face. Stop whining about it. You're a child of the king. Act like it. Jeez, it drives me insane. Oh, Pastor, I just, you know, the enemies just... Stop it, dude. Just stop it. Man, stand up. Do what Paul said. We talked about this yesterday at the men's conference. Paul tells us to put on all the armor of God. Then he says, and having done all to stand, what comes next? Stand. stand. Does, does that like... Really difficult to grasp? I, I don't understand. What's the point of getting armored up if you're not going to be in the dang fight? Now imagine if the soldiers, all of our soldiers in the military, these wonderful people that do this, these things. Imagine if they said, well, I don't know. I just don't think I can do this. And well, the enemy's just got us outnumbered. And well, gee, the people here really more for the enemy than for us. I don't know. What would you say to that? I can tell you what the commander would say. It would not be good. So that, that's what we're talking about here. So when they read, they went into this. Now these, the Jews of this synagogue, were more, more fair-minded. Some, uh, some of your translations say noble. But it's, the, the word noble can mean that in the scripture, but depending on the context. In other words, being noble birth or an aristocracy kind of thing. But the word is used here in the sense that these people were generous. They were understanding. They were smart enough to listen and to think it through. How do we know that? Because look at this. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. We saw what the Jews did there. They were jealous. And they raised up the crowd and did all of this stuff. But these guys were more fair-minded in that they received the word, notice, with all readiness. Now, what did they receive? Paul? No. They received the word. Imagine that. We always want to go out there and say, well, you know, this person is doing this ministry. Well, it's not about that person. It's about the message that the messenger's carrying. We've already talked about this. But we always want to focus on the messenger. But they received the word, which means Paul is still preaching the word. They received the word with all readiness. They were excited about this. And they were like, man, tell me more. They wanted to know. They weren't satisfied with the typical church service that we find ourselves often guilty of, right? They just weren't. So they received the word with all readiness. Notice, I love this. And they searched. This means that they dug hard. They searched the scriptures, when? Daily. Daily. It wasn't a simple scratching of the surface and saying, oh, look what we found. When I teach the IBS class, which I know many of you have been through, some of you a few times, I always start off with an example that's very closely related to this. Because God always has these great valuable treasures, but they're never just lying around on the surface. They're just not. Yes, there's valuable things, but the more valuable is deeper. And the more willing you are to dig and get bloodied up, cut up your fingers, smash them, do whatever, the deeper you dig, the more you find. That's the cool thing about the Word of God. 
I mean, after 30 years of ministry, I've gotten to the point, I don't even use the word anymore, I know it all. <laughs> you know what you find after 30 years of ministering and studying God's word? You don't know squat. It never ceases to amaze me. And it's like, how can we ever get a hold of an infinite book that is given by an infinite God when we are not infinite? There's no end to this. So these guys searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They didn't just listen to Paul. They went into the scripture to see if what Paul was saying matched. Remember, we read, he did that to the Thessalonians from the Old Testament. He showed about the Christ suffering, the Christ rising again, and that Jesus was this Christ. These guys got it. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. I've told you a hundred times, if you walk out of this building today, believe in everything I've told you, then you're nuttier than I am. You need to test what I'm saying with the scripture. Just as simple as that. Otherwise, how do you know whether I'm telling you the truth or not? You don't. We make it sound really, really good. Right? But you don't know. You got to test these things out with the scripture. Always put those that teach to the test with the scripture. And stop listening to this perspective and that perspective or this belief or this theological system. Stop it. There were none of those things. Paul just reasoned from the scriptures. Whatever happened to reasoning from the scriptures? It's, it's absolutely stunning. Therefore, because these people did this, many of them believed. Now again, not all. The gospel will not always be responded to positively. People, some people just will not respond, no matter how well you present it. They just won't. You can't let that stop you. Five years of ministry in Belize and the hundreds of people that we ministered to. And I can count on, well, I can't count on one hand, but you can count the people that really were impacted by the message that we brought. Not very many. Because the lives are still continuing on as they were when we were there trying to help these people not do these things. So it's, it's, you, you, just, you, you have to trust God and pray that at some point it takes root and it begins to grow. Therefore, many of them believed and also not a few of the Greeks. And here we go again. The prominent dang women. They're everywhere. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. In our church, they show up on Tuesday mornings and Thursday nights. <laughs> No, but, it, but that's what's happening. Did you see? The, notice, notice the contrast between the two synagogues. The disregard for the scripture in Thessalonica because of jealousy, but the diligence in the scripture in um, Berea. Thank you. <laughs> There's the, the, the difference is absolutely stunning. Oh man, everything is going great, and it is. Could you imagine if you're Paul after all of that struggle and getting people and all of a sudden all these people are suddenly responding to your thing. You're just thinking, oh, God is so in this. It's so refreshing to see the positive and the growth. And even though there are those that still don't believe, there's no hostility. There's no mobs ruling. And everything is just hunky-dory. And we can just sort of kick back now on our church recliners and listen to the man up front. Because it's all going so well. Well, there's a couple more verses, but there it is again. But when the Jews from where? Thessalonica learned of this. They're going, that little dweeb left our city and went over there and is doing the same thing over there. So they hired up the same guys. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, once again, the word of God, not Paul, but Paul is the one that's proclaiming it. They came there also and stirred up the crowds. But I thought everything was going so well. You know how you know everything is going well and the ministry is successful? When this happens. When they come after you. And yet we try to avoid conflict, conflict and, and all of these trials and stuff like the plague. And yet those are great indicators that what you're doing for God is right. The enemy will never allow you to move forward without trying to stop it. And that's what's happening here. Now immediately, the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. He didn't actually go to the sea. That's where they thought. But both Paul, both, both Sil I'm, I said Paul and Timothy remained in Thessalonica. Sorry about that. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. They remained in Berea. The success of the ministry, you guys, and what we do as a believer is not dependent on numbers. It's never been and never will be. 
It's dependent on whether or not the word of God is being communicated. I've told you guys a hundred times in the past, I am not responsible for your spiritual walk. I'm not. You're responsible for your spiritual walk and your kids. What I'm responsible for and the, all the leadership at the church is to communicate the truth of God, explaining and demonstrating the truth. And then your obligation is to either respond or reject that truth to which there are consequences of each. My job is I'm called to teach and to proclaim the truth. And that's what I work at doing. I can't change your lives, nor do I want to. I can't change your minds or your hearts. That is God. Whether or not you respond to the teaching of the scripture is on you. You will not stand before God and say, well, I would have been okay if that guy, Rick. No. no, you're responsible for your own faith. These people took responsibility. You see, there's always two approaches to the truth when it's being taught. You can resist it for envy or a multitude of other reasons, or you can embrace it because it is simply the truth. And it doesn't have to be wrapped up in, in, in pretty stuff. I mean... Do I look pretty to you? Well, I do to Marie. But to the rest of you, not so much. But see, it's always about the dynamic, you know, presence of the teacher. No, it's not. It's not about the person that's proclaiming the message at all. Period. End of story. It's about the message. Better get it straightened out, man. Because that's the significance. That's what we learn from the scriptures. So I pray that you're taking what we're being taught here every, morning, every Sunday morning and all of the other stuff that we've got going on and you're taking it and it's not just getting to here because if it just gets to here and then to here, it will do you no good. Nothing will have changed. But if it gets from here to here to here, then your life will be what you always hoped it would be. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Don't buy into this garbage again on TV that if you follow the Lord, everything is going to be just fine. And by faith, by faith, by faith, you know, God has, if God has to do anything, he ain't God. You are. Now God will respond, clearly. But you don't make that a requirement of it. So, that's what we learn from this chapter. Now as we move forward, we're going to see that Paul's going to continue on. He's going to move from this place to this place called Athens. Yes, that Athens still exists today. And then he's going to go to another place called Corinth which is the Las Vegas of the New Testament. <laughs> what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Unless, of course, it's the message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand. We'll close in a word of prayer.